Hello. I'm Stephen Nayrod. I'm a doctor and a breast cancer researcher, a breast cancer researcher at Women's College Hospital in Toronto for 22 years. <clears throat> when I arrived at Women's College in 1995, we treated breast cancer, most women with breast cancer, with lumpectomy. Removed the cancer and a bit of the surrounding breast, but left the breast intact. This operation became very common because of a blockbuster paper in 1985 showing that the survival, the death rate, of women treated with lumpectomy and with total mastectomy were about the same. And so we adopted that as a standard of care. What's surprising is in the last 10 years, we've seen a shift, a shift from lumpectomy to many women are getting, and you've heard of it in the news, bilateral mastectomies. Both breasts are being removed for the treatment of a single breast cancer that could be managed by a lumpectomy alone, by breast conserving surgery. Why are a third of women getting this operation? So I get asked, I look at individual patients' decisions, surprising decisions, and then I go back to the charts and the data and looking at patterns which I've collected in all the patients at Women's College Hospital over the past 25 years. Why are these choices being made? Who's to say it's the right decision and whose decision is it? The patient, the doctor, or the healthcare system that's paying the bill? Now, we're talking tonight about personalized medicine in 2012. I think we entered the field, the notion of personalized medicine, whereas each individual as a patient, we could break them down the risk on a personal level, rather than yes or no, we could even give numbers from one to 100 describing an individual's risk. Around 2012, I asked, is this really a good idea? Is this going to work? We're hearing from other speakers tonight. In other words, is the information that we give to the patient meaningful for them in the same way information is meaningful for the doctor? And in 2012, I got my first surprise. This is a, uh, in 2008, at Women's College Hospital, we offered genetic testing to all Jewish women for practical reasons. Now we offer it to all women. And at that time, based on this advertisement, or this free advertisement in the Globe and Mail, we had 8,000 women come to Women's College Hospital on Bay Street take us up on our offer. Now, this was for BRCA1 and BRCA2. Some were given a positive test, some were given a negative test. The women that were given a positive test, we told them, you have a 20% risk of ovarian cancer. Furthermore, we said the best treatment for that is having your ovaries removed. The women we gave a negative test, we said you have a 1% chance of ovarian cancer, and there's really nothing we recommend to do about that. Now, a year later, being diligent researchers, we called them back and asked them a couple of questions. What do you think your risk of ovarian cancer is and what did you do about it? Well, the good news was the women who had a positive test, they estimated their risk to be 20% and diligently they had gone to their doctors and had their ovaries removed. Then we asked the women with a negative test what they thought their risk of ovarian cancer was and they said 20%. But none of them had had their ovaries removed. They both interpreted 20% as different. One was a positive test requiring action. One was a normal result requiring nothing but, which is reassuring. Second example, 2015. We did a very large study, got a lot of press on ductal carcinoma in situ, or DCIS, was published in JAMA. And in that paper, we showed that the risk of dying of breast cancer after this ductal carcinoma in situ which is an early or a precursor lesion, a very early form of cancer. And we showed that the risk of dying in 20 years of breast cancer for women with that diagnosis was 3%. Now, someone considered that reassuring, but other women considered that, oh my gosh, and ran off and had a bilateral mastectomy. For these women, the 3% encouraged them, was a signal that they needed surgery and they had to have their breasts removed. Now, if we go on the streets of Toronto and ask the average women what you think your risk of dying of breast cancer is, 
Most of them will say greater than 3%. But for them, that's not an ominous number. It's just a number that they feel they could live with and move on and go along their way. I don't think it's the numbers that count. I think it's the idea of being told you have a positive test or a negative test. And even when we use a personalized medicine approach and we give them a number, precise number between one and 100, they'll say to me, well, doctor, but is that positive or negative? Third example, or which relates to a second question. What is our goal, the goal of the doctor and the goal of the patient, and are those the same? Is it to prevent, I'm a cancer doctor, so I said, well, you know, we want to prevent primarily death from cancer. We also want to prevent cancer and we want to alleviate cancer worry. But which of these are the most important? All three are relevant, but by having, generating worry about cancer, we may be creating a new generation of worried women. Now let's consider a uh, woman in 2017, a young woman with breast cancer. I told you before, they would have a uh, unilateral lumpectomy. It was a standard of choice until recently. And now they say, doctor, uh, the doctor says you could have a lumpectomy. This is the least invasive surgery and has the best chance of survival. So the patient says, yes, I want to have a mastectomy. I want to be for, there for my children. What she really means is, that, yes, but I'm having this anxiety about a new cancer every day. And what I really want is the relief of that pressing anxiety. And by having a bilateral mastectomy, it's going to take away the worry of ever getting another cancer. So which of these is the most important? Now, consider this, uh, this is very interesting. So I work in Poland in the summer. I spend a month every year in Poland running a big cancer research program in Szczecin. And what we find is really interesting is that young women under 40 with breast cancer in Poland do better than they do in Ontario. Interesting, surprising, but moreover, we find that the Polish women almost always have chemotherapy and tamoxifen. Whereas the Canadian women, it's often less. Why is that? Because we've developed this concept that choice is paramount in the patients. It's the right to have a choice. I'm not saying it's not. I'm just saying when we introduce the concept of choice in Canada, which is progressive versus in Poland, where it's still paternalistic, we see that many women are given the choice as well, I'll choose not to have the therapy. There are consequences to that. And I'd just like to finish up this was a drug that was introduced for breast cancer and was a big article, I can see in November, uh, November 2017, was described as new hope for women with breast and ovarian cancer. Now, if you see the article, you'd say new hope against a lethal form of cancer, you would assume that that reduced the number of deaths or even extended the lifespan. But in fact, it doesn't. It, 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 delays progression but doesn't affect the lifespan or cure the patient. When I pointed that out as the sole dissenter, actually, in the New England Journal of Medicine, I said, I think it's disingenuous for the drug companies in the journal to pr pr promote this drug as one that saves lives because it doesn't. Uh, it was really mix met with a mixed reaction from my colleagues. In fact, I was kind of surprised to end on this note, but one of the patients said to me, well, doctor, after reading my article, I ate my breakfast and went back to bed. The day had just begun. I wish you would remove your treaties from the internet. It serves no purpose except to dash the hopes of thousands of women around the world. Don't see, steal my hope, doctor, it's all I have. So I don't have the answer to these questions. We certainly want to be able to offer the best hope is a quality of life and to, for our, for our patients, but we also have to raise the question as a society has discussed before, is it in the interest of the Canadian to offer drugs that don't really work in order only to increase the well-being in terms of the hope of the patients? It's a difficult question I think we all get to face. But just to summarize over time, I think you know I really changed my way of thinking at Women's College over the last 25 years and starting to think more about some of these decisions we make who should be making the decisions? Is it always wise? Should we have more impact from the government, federal and provincial, in helping us guide our way? But moreover, I think it's very important to capture these stories, stories of the women with cancer on an individual level, 
and also to document them and to be able to keep track of them in order to make the best use of the information and to guide us in our choices in the future. Thank you.